So once again, hello everyone, and welcome to today's online workshop. Today's topic is GPL in the WordPress training team's vetting process. Um, so I'm Ben, and today I have O'Neill, um, and the two of us will be presenting um, what GPL is and how we use it in the training team's vetting process. So today, we'll be looking at, first of all, what open source is um, and what free software is. Um, the second point, what the GPL software license is um, in general. And then third, um, why the training team looks for GPL adherence when vetting for some roles. Um, and then finally, we'll do a bit of a demonstration of how we actually vet applications. Um, so you'll get a behind the scenes look at um, how we go about doing that. All right, so jumping right in, um, what is open source? So you may have heard of the word before. Open source is software with source code that anyone can inspect, modify, and enhance. So open source is where the, the source code, the code behind a piece of software is open and free for anyone to have a look at, to change, and modify to meet their needs. So the opposite of open source is proprietary software. And um, when you purchase software from a lot of companies like to install into your computer, they used to come on like CD-ROMs or even floppy disks before that. Um, this software would have been compiled and um, so in, into a, like a machine, uh, into, into a format that can only be read by a machine. So a human couldn't look at the code and make changes because it was already compiled and encrypted so that only machines could run the software. Um, so that's how different companies protected their software. They would compile it and sell it. Uh, but open source um, keeps the code uncompiled so people can still examine the code and make changes if they want to. Um, so WordPress is open source. You can have a look at the source code behind WordPress. And it's also free software. So I also want to take a moment to consider what free software is. When we, when we talk about free software, especially in open source, um, we are talking about freedom and not necessarily price. So as it says here, the term free in free open source software refers to freedom, not monetary cost. So in a sense, you could have open source you purchase, which is still free because it's, it, it provides freedom to the user. Um, WordPress is free in both price and it provides freedom. Um, but today in a couple of our slides, we'll be talking about free software and the freedoms of software. Um, so I just want everyone to keep in mind, we're not talking about price when we talk about free, we're talking about freedoms. And um, you, can form more, you can find more information about, um, oops, about um, the freedoms of open source um, on a website called opensource.org. So I'm gonna drop that link in the Zoom chat here and you can refer to that later. <clears throat> All right. Um, so that is the definition of free software. So um, looking into more details, there are four freedoms included um, in free software. The first one is the freedom to run the program for any purpose. So um, free software says you can run the program for anything. You can run it for uh, your personal blog. You can run it for a not-for-profit organization. You can run it for a for profit organization, you can run it for a business, um, you can run it for any purpose. The second freedom is the freedom to study how the program works and change it to make it do what you wish. So again, this is opposite to propriety software, which has already um, compiled the software and encrypted it, so you can't really study it or change it. Free software gives you the freedom to study and change it. So when we provide free software to other people, they can change it to match their needs. 
The third freedom is the freedom to redistribute the software. So they can then share that software with their friends. Um, they can even make modifications and then share those modified versions with other people, which is the fourth freedom. The freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to other people. So the four freedoms are the freedom to run the program, the freedom to change the program, the freedom to redistribute the program, and finally, the, oops, the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to other people. And we'll be looking at these four freedoms um, um, in more detail, or specifically to the WordPress project in further slides here. Um, and again, I have another link here um, for more information about free software and open source. Um, you can have a look at um, the GNU um, license website, and they give a bit more information about the freedoms provided in free software. Um, so let me just pause there quickly. Are there any questions so far? We've been talking about very general concepts of open source and freedom. We'll dive into WordPress specific things next. Are there, are there anything, any questions or anything you want clarified? No, very cool. Thank you. All right. Well, so what does this mean for WordPress specifically? So the WordPress project, we also, um, the WordPress project also has these four freedoms um, connected to its software. The WordPress software is licensed under the general public license, um, which is often shortened to GPL. And um, specifically, um, the GPL states this, WordPress can be run by anyone for any purpose. Anyone can study any aspect of the WordPress code. WordPress can be downloaded and shared with and by anyone. And fin finally, anyone can download and modify WordPress and distribute modified copies. So this is basically the four freedoms we talked about before. Um, but as it applies to the WordPress project. Now, um, the GP, uh, sorry, the GPL license, the general public license states that any software, so any modified software or any derivative software of a GPL license software must also carry the GPL license. So, you can download WordPress, you can modify WordPress, you can redistribute WordPress, but when you redistribute WordPress, you must also add the GPL license to that redistributed version of WordPress. That is, um, the only, in my mind, the only requirement that comes with the GPL license. The requirement to add the GPL license to any modified versions of the original software. So that means, you can't download WordPress, make changes, and then sell that changed version of um, WordPress to a limited number of people. Like um, your software has to be, uh, so you can't sell like a, a compiled version of that WordPress. Your software, your modified version also has to be um, available for anybody to write. It also has to be um, studyable by anybody. Um, it, needs to be able to be redistributed by other people. Um, so the GPL license um, talks about the modified versions of WordPress, but it also talks about the derivative works. So anything that needs WordPress to run must also carry the GPL license. So if you have extra code that sort of connects to WordPress and these extra pieces of code need WordPress in order to run, then these extra pieces of code should also carry the GPL license, which is the freedom to run it for any purpose, study it, um, download it, and share it, and share modified versions. In For WordPress specifically, these derivative works, these extra add-ons are called plugins and themes. So for the WordPress project, Plugin authors and theme authors are asked to 
uh, make their plugins and themes available with the same freedoms attached to the main WordPress software. Because plugins and themes need WordPress in order to work, plugins and themes also should carry the GPL freedoms. So talking a bit more detail, what is the GPL? Um, the GPL is, I'm, I'm reading some notes here. So if, I, if I'm looking down like this, um, please forgive me. Um, let's see. So the GPL license was originally writ written in 1989 uh, by the Free Software Foundation. And it is the founding license for open source software. Um, so the GPL was created so that um, rather than restricting distribution, um, it allows people to distribute their code um, So let me, let me refer to the GPL was set to make it um, so that source code would be distributed more. It would be shared more amongst people and improved more. Um, so let's see, proprietary software, which doesn't carry the freedoms, is created by usually one, one company and their developers, and they're the only people who can make changes and updates, and um, they choose who they want to sell it to. GPL takes a totally different approach and says, um, let's all share our software, let's all make it better together. And it was the one of the founding philosophies um, of the open source concepts in the world. So the GPL states, if you take a piece of software that's licensed under GPL and create a derivative work of it, that derivative work must also be licensed with GPL. Um, this is important because if you don't honor the GPL, the license to use the source program will terminate and it would breach the terms of usage. So if you were to create a derivative work that isn't licensed with GPL, then you'd actually be breaking the terms and conditions you signed up to when using the original GPL license. And this means um, people are free to fork license uh, software. So when you fork software, you take a copy of something and you make modifications. So the main software keeps on developing um, and gets updates and you make, and you sort of branch off from that. And so you can add your own updates and your own features to this forked piece of software. And the GPL actually protects this because um, people are allowed to make modifications and then share their modifications. Um, so GPL makes forking software uh, possible as long as the forked software also carries the GPL license. Um, a copy of the GPL license is actually included with every WordPress installation. Um, you may not have ever looked in the source code to find the license before, um, but we also have the text. You can also have a look at the text of the GPL license at this link I've just added to the Zoom chat. All right, so that, that, that's a little background and technical information about the GPL. Um, any questions so far? Hopefully I haven't made it too confusing here. Recall, okay. What does the whole licensing issue look like in terms of teaching? Is there anything to consider? How does it look when a school pays me to produce teaching materials? Can I also mention the school as a sponsor in videos and documentation, et cetera? Okay, that's a good point because we talk about um, paid, paid features and the GPL license in a few more slides. So let me hold that question for just a few more slides and we'll get to that. Um, GPL, a, a quick answer is GPL doesn't prohibit selling things. Like you can make money off GPL licensed software, um, but there are some things to take in consideration. So we'll get to that question in just a moment. Uh, but thank you for asking that. All right, so 
WordPress is licensed under GPL, which protects four freedoms. Um, and we talked about how derivative works must also carry the GPL license and carry the same four freedoms. So now we're going to narrow in further and look at plugins and themes. So WordPress has plugins and themes. What, how does GPL apply to plugins and themes? So again, we have four freedoms. Number one, a plugin or theme can be used by anyone for any purpose. So if, if somebody is distributing a plugin and saying, this can only be used by schools, then they're actually restricting this first freedom. here. Um, the GPL says plugins and themes can be used by anyone. So uh, we can't, they shouldn't restrict who is allowed to use it. The second freedom, anyone can study any aspect of the plugin theme and code. So um, plugins and themes aren't compiled when they're distributed. Their source code is open and anybody can study them. Thirdly, a plugin or theme can be downloaded and shared with and by anyone. So technically you could ask a fee to distribute a plugin to somebody, but you can't restrict that person from distributing it further. So a plugin or theme you distribute can then be downloaded and shared with anyone. So you can't restrict how that is redistributed beyond that person you gave it to. And number four, anyone can download and modify the plugin theme and distribute modified copies. Um, again, so plugins and themes, um, anybody can take that, modify the code, and then share that modified version with other people as well. So these are the four freedoms as they apply to plugins and themes. But, in the WordPress ecosystem, you will see there are paid plugins and themes. So this is um, this is why the free software, the free in free software, is referring to freedoms and not price because you can have paid for free software. Um, so let's have a look at this. Play, paid plugins and themes can also be GPL compliant if they don't conflict with the four freedoms. So the important thing is that the, the money that is exchanged isn't restricting the four freedoms we talked about before. So for example, um, some plugins offer um, support as part of a subscription. So once you download the plugin, um, there's an option for you to pay for a year of support. This is, this is GPL compliant because they're not, the plugin itself isn't restricted. You can look at the plugin, you can study the plugin, you can redistribute the plugin. What you are paying for is for the customer service people who are going to respond to your questions. So your payment has nothing to do with the freedoms of the software. It is for the subscription with that company who are going to be supporting you over the next year. So that sort of setup is GPL compliant. However, sometimes when you do a Google search, um, you may find plugins or themes that say, this can only be used on X number of sites. And this is not GPL compliant because one of the freedoms of GPL is for you to redistribute the code. And so you should have the freedom to install the code on other sites or other uh, any number of sites. So if they are restricting the number of sites it can be used on, then that is not GPL compliant. Um, so let me pause then and come to your question, Rico. So you said, what does the whole licensing issue look like in terms of teaching? Is there anything to consider? How does it look when the school pays me to produce teaching materials? So when the school pays you for teaching materials, they're paying you for your time you invested in creating the curriculum, the time you spent teaching it. Um, and so that payment has nothing to do with the freedom of the WordPress software you're using in your classes. Um, so um, it is totally acceptable to receive that payment for your teaching. Um, and it doesn't conflict with the GPL licensing. 
And then it says, can I also mention that schools as a sponsor in videos and documents, etc.? Yes. So in your personal like videos and documents, you can mention these schools are financing your work. Um, that is totally okay. And I see you just dropped a question here, which isn't English. But there are purchase plugins that you can only install on X sites. Yeah. So WordPress asked that plugins and themes are GPL compliant. But when you look in the world, there are plugins and themes that aren't GPL compliant. So they aren't honoring the four freedoms that should be included in plugins and themes. And that is why there is a vetting process for some roles in the training team. Um, if every plugin and every theme was GPL compliant automatically, then we wouldn't need the vetting process because they'd already be GPL compliant. Um, but because there are people who create and distribute plugins and themes in a non-GPL compliant way, we have to vet applications to make sure they are honoring the GPL system before they are allowed into some roles in the training team. Um, so that's a good observation, Rico, and that is a good segue into our next slide where we start looking at the training team specifically. So let's pause for a moment. What is the WordPress training team? So we're moving away from GPL and all that, just in general, what is the WordPress training team? So the WordPress training team helps people learn to use, extend, and contribute to WordPress through synchronous and asynchronous learning via learn.wordpress.org. So um, hopefully people watching this video have seen the learn.wordpress.org website. Um, it looks a bit like this. We have tutorials, we have lesson plans, we have courses. We also have online workshops. So somebody creates this content online. Somebody um, maintains this content. If there's a WordPress update, we have to update the content. That somebody is the WordPress training team. So the WordPress training team is made up of volunteers who said, we want to contribute to learn.wordpress.org and um, present high quality education material for other people in the world to use as well. The training team's vision is to be the coordinator for all the content on Learn WordPress. We want Learn WordPress to be the go-to resource for learning and teaching WordPress. Um, so Rico, you said you're a teacher and um, if you look in the world, there are probably hundreds, maybe thousands of teachers out there who are creating their own resources, their own material to teach WordPress to different age groups, to different communities, well, what would be ideal is if they, if Learn WordPress could be that central hub where everybody shared their knowledge, shared their resources, um, and then you could take that into your communities and teach people there. That is the vision of the training team. Um, we're not there yet. Um, the Learn WordPress website still has a long way to grow, grow um, but that is our vision. That's what we're working towards. Um, so here I've got a table, we call it the training team contributor ladder. You don't have to read all the details, um, but what, what I wanted to point out is at the top here, we have some areas of contribution. So the training team has content creators, we have editors, we have subject matter experts, and we have administrators. Um, so content creators are the people who make content, but we also have editors who review content before it is published or edit published content um, when an update needs to be made. We also have subject matter experts who are experts of the different content topics who assist content creators as they make content. And then we also have administrators who look after a lot of the tasks behind the scene that keep the website and the team running. Um, and then you'll see down the left here, we have a a progression so um, of contribution. So when people first join the team, they're in the connecting stage. And as they contribute more to the team, 
they move to the engaging stage and then the performing stage and then the leading stage. So the training team is made up of different areas of expertise and people move through a, a like a growing progression through the team as they contribute more and more to the team. Um, now, out of all that, most of those roles can be done by anybody. There are just four roles we vet for GPL adherence um, before they are given special access to tools um, and, and before they're accepted into those roles. So I just want to clarify most of the roles on the table beforehand um, aren't necessarily vetted uh, for GPL adherence. Um, there are just four roles we vet for. Those are faculty members, which are like the mentors in the training team, um, online workshop facilitators, online workshop co-hosts. So that is like me and O'Neill today who are presenting in online workshops and tutorial presenters. So tutorials are our five to 10 minute videos on Learn WordPress and that talk about a specific topic. Now, these roles are vetted for GPL adherence because these people become the face of WordPress in different recordings and in team leadership. So I mentioned before, um, online workshops are recorded and uploaded to WordPress.tv and basically they're there forever. So even after I die, me talking today is going to remain on WordPress TV as a recording forever. And so in a sense, I am the face of WordPress. The GPL license is very important to WordPress and we, we want everyone to follow GPL. Um, unfortunately, some people don't, um, but that's why we check to make sure people who become the face of WordPress are following GPL because the GPL license is that important to the WordPress project. So these people become, the, in a sense, the face of WordPress and that's why they are vetted for GPL adherence. All right, so how are they vetted? <clears throat> so in the training team handbook, it says these people, the, the four roles I mentioned before, they must embrace the WordPress license. This means that if they are distributing WordPress derivative works, such as themes, plugins, um, et cetera, these people or their business should give their users the same freedoms that WordPress itself provides. So we've been talking about four freedoms. And so if I were to create a plugin or a theme, I would be checked beforehand to make sure those plugins or themes are giving people the same freedoms that the WordPress software itself provides through the GPL license. So in short, I don't make plugins or themes. Um, so I don't make derivative works. So I am automatically cleared for GPL oh. adherence because I, I, I don't distribute anything. Um, but if you were a plugin developer or a theme developer, or if you worked for a company that created plugins or themes, then we would check those plugins and themes to make sure they kept the four freedoms that are included in the GPL license. Now, how do we do this specifically? Um, we, the, the WordPress project has 22 teams. One of them is the community team. The community team has created a 100% GPL vetting checklist. Um, so I'll copy this and put it in the Zoom chat here for people. And I won't go through all of this now, but you can have a look at this later. Um, but the 100% GPL vetting checklist, I think it's like a 10 step checklist, and like step one. Um, does the speaker can distribute or promote WordPress themes? If you want, skip to number five. If yes, continue. So it's like a yes, no chart. Um, and you just walk through the checklist and go all the way to the bottom. And then once you get to the bottom, it says, yes, this person is GPL compliant or they're not. Um, this is probably one of the best resources we have to help us check GPL compliant. Um, of course, we don't have to follow that, but it's a good reference point. Um, and it also helps you if you want to apply for these different roles, you can sort of have a look at what process we'll be going through 
um, in that vetting process. So we try to be as transparent as possible. This 3PL vetting doesn't happen in secret. We try to be open about what we're checking for, why we're checking it. Um, but again, if you have any questions, um, you are free to ask us, not just in this online workshop, but you can always join the training team in channel uh, Slack and we'd be happy to answer your questions there. And one other thing I wanted to note is if somebody applies to become, say, an online workshop presenter, and we notice their plugin or theme isn't GPL compliant, we, we um, would like to offer guidance on helping that person make their plugin or theme GPL compliant. We're not gonna just say, nah, you don't make the cut. Um, what we would actually like to see is you or, the, or that person update their plugin and theme so that it is GPL compliant and then it, it does carry the four freedoms of the GPL license. Um, because sometimes people distribute plugins or themes not really understanding the GPL license. And so it's not that they intend the, to prohibit some of the freedoms, they just didn't understand it well. And so we want to help these people understand why the GPL license is important and help them change their products um, so that it is GPL compliant. Um, so yeah, that brings us to the end of the explanation. And I'll now hand it over to O'Neill for the live demonstration. Before we move there though, are there any questions people wanted to ask about what we've talked about so far? Sanya, I see you came in later in the session. Thank you for joining. Um, I hope, was there anything you wanted us to clarify before we jump into the live demonstration? Rico. Can I also publish learning material at learn.wordpress.org with sponsor mentions? That is a good question. <clears throat> and the training team has a handbook page that talks about, let's see, da, 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 da. so brand usage guidelines and promotional guidelines. So I think your question, this promotional guidelines page is going to be the most relevant. Um, so I'll copy a link and put them in the Zoom chat here. Um, so the quick answer is, um, in most of our resources, we do allow the content creator to do a, um, a little bit of self-promotion. So you can mention your name, um, your social accounts, um, but the focus of the content is to be the content. And... The WordPress project is made up of a lot of, um, I don't know. Uh, let me stop that thought. Um, so we want the focus of the content to be the content and we want to promote WordPress and the WordPress brand as much as possible. Um, so regarding sponsor mentions, I'm not sure if that's come up specifically in the training team before. Um, have a look at this guide. It might be something um, you could ask the training team and we could all consider together to see if it's appropriate or not. Um, I, I, I don't have enough knowledge to give a yes or no answer right now. Or Neil, is there something you wanted to add to that? I feel like it's something we'd have to discuss as a team. Yeah, I think so. I've never actually yeah. encountered this. Yeah. So good question, Rico. Um, and yet, if, if you are interested in joining the training team and um, mentioning your sponsors is something important to you, then do let us know. Um, and it is definitely something the training team can consider. Um, let me share one more link. Um, this is the training team's onboarding program. So if you're brand new to the training team, this link I just dropped in the Zoom chat is um, a good place to start and it will walk you through getting set up with the training team. It'll help you um, create a Slack account so you can join the training team Slack and bring your questions there. And then the training team would be more than happy to discuss that with you um, because we would like to see more contributors. Um, and so, yes, please, please join us there. All right, O'Neill, let me hand it over to you then. Um, and you can do a live demonstration of what it looks like to vet a application. 
Right. I'm going to stop my share once. And then do you have the ability to share? Yes, I do. Okay. Okay. Sharing my screen now. Thank you, Ben. Okay. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Um, this is just essentially the steps that we take when vetting an application. So the first thing that's going to happen once you apply as a uh, tutorial presenter, we're going to receive an email. The faculty admin will receive an email. We're using Ben as an example. He's volunteered his own information as an example here. So the first thing you're going to see here is the name of the applicant. So Benjamin Evans or Ben Evans. You can actually include that in one of your search strings. One of the first things I do is check the information that's given here, email address. Um, one thing you can look at here, if there are any previous conversations within Help Scout, which means Ben, if Ben has communicated with the tutorial, uh, with the training team, with uh, another part of the Learn WordPress group in a previous conversation, he's applied for another uh, position in the training team, like online presenter or tutorial presenter, it should appear here if he uses the same email address. But if he's using a different one, then it'll, it won't appear in the same as previous conversation. So that's one thing you should check if he's already applied before. And then the next thing you should check is uh, the username. So you put that, which means this is his profile in the w in wordpress.org you enter this into his profile here and then you come up with this information so you'll see here full name and member since march 23rd so you copy this information put it into the list so that you have all of this information that he has uh, location uh, the name of his blog, so his website this is, can be a work blog or it can be a personal blog. So you can copy this information as well. And then you can also check his GitHub uh, contributions. So you can also see if he's actually been active within the WordPress GitHub, uh, job title and the employer. So one thing we like to check also is whether he's working for a company that uh, is GPL compliant, whether the, the software that they release, the themes that they release are, are GPL compliant. So you can check here, uh, Ben working for automatic. So you can check, there's actually a list of these companies that are already GPL compliant. This is a complete list of the companies that create themes. So there's a list, and then you can see whether they're GPL compliant here. This is all just one way of checking if the company is GPL compliant. And then you go through the other information, what type of tutorials. So uh, Ben is looking at creating uh, different types of tutorials. You can also copy his expertise. So you copy this information. It also helps to make a, an Excel list so that you can add it as a note into the email. And then next will be his um, social media accounts. Social media that he, he included is Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. So you can check all of these, Twitter, whether it's an uh, active account, you can see the, comp the information, the company that he contributes to, uh, his interaction with other people in WordPress, uh, his um, attending word camps or meetups within this region, within the area. You can also check Facebook. You can also see other information that he does here. He indicates where he works, his location. This is just to confirm the information that he's being given, he has given in the email. LinkedIn is actually very helpful because you'll also see uh, professional connections. So people who he works with or he's connected to in professionally. And then the activity, whether he um, contributes to WordPress activities, workshops, and uh, WordCamps. So that's also the information there. And then Instagram, some people also like to post things that they do on Instagram. And another thing we also check is whether the person is active on Meetup. 
uh, Meetup is where what the software we use for organizing the events, the activities. So you can see when Ben joined, how often he's RSVP'd for activities, and when was the last time he visited a group. So you can see whether they're also active in the group. Um, and then another thing we also like to do is do a Google search by just the name, either the full name or a nickname, and then WordPress. So you can also see the social accounts, whether uh, they're also active in uh, other online activities. And then going back to his profile, you can also see um, the contributions of, for example, Ben. He has, you can see he has multiple badges included with his contribution. So he's actually very active in different aspects of the WordPress community, uh, translation, training as a speaker and WordPress TV com contributor. And then lower here, you can see other activity within GitHub, within the workshops, uh, take, even taking the courses and whether they are active also on Slack, on writing comments on the forums. And if you're already part of the WordPress Slack, you can also check there if uh, the applicant has uh, contributed to the training team meetings and uh, whether they're also active in the discussion. So a lot of these things are just basically searching online different places where you can see the activities that they've done. And then of course you can see, make sure that the software that they're producing, whether it's plugins or themes are have the GPL compliance by going through the checklist, then you can determine whether uh, they should be approved or if there are any red flags that we should watch out for or uh, recommend that they can adjust their their GPL license to be able to be compliant for the WordPress um, GPL so that they can become part of the WordPress training team. And after that, we'll reply to Ben and then select and then whether it's approved or declined, then you can just say approved and then reply to his, send him his email, and then he can start contributing to the WordPress, learn WordPress uh, training team. That's all. Thank you very much, O'Neill. Um, does anybody have any questions about that process? Any questions, um, anything you'd like O'Neill to show again? I have a question, O'Neill. Just on average, yeah. how long would it take you to vet an applicant? Like, is it five minutes, fifteen minutes? Ah, um, for example, like the your application, you listed your social accounts. That makes it mm -hmm. faster, makes it easier to find mm -hmm. um, your presence online. Uh, mm -hmm. If you list your company, the company that creates the plugins, whether it's your a developer, uh theme creator, it makes it faster. But there are some who just indicate their email, their name, if they don't have that much information, or if they use different names, uh, different from their profile, it makes it a little harder. So it might take maybe a couple of hours to look through and confirm if this person who applied is actually the same person on LinkedIn, same person mm -hmm. in the company. So maybe uh, one, or two hours to go through mm -hmm. an application, possibly longer if they have limited information. But what we do if they don't have enough information is we send them a follow-up email asking if they can uh, indicate their contribution to WordPress specific and specify what they've done in the WordPress mm -hmm. space. Okay, thank you. Um, Rico also asked a question. Um, how many people will be bled off? So I, I presume you mean like will be declined as a as a, a result of this. Do you want to answer that, Neil? Yeah. Um, actually, we've. It's very rare that there's going to be a big red flag. Um, some people, there are 
spam applications, which is essentially uh, just a bot maybe trying to apply, trying to fill in the form. So that one, we check it. If they don't respond, I usually send them a follow-up email to get more information. If they don't respond within a week, I mark that as spam. But if there's an application that has certain information that's not consistent, uh, meaning their name is different from their profile on other social accounts or even LinkedIn, or if it's uh, on a, if they have a, their company account or company website is not compliant, then that is already a red flag. Or if they don't have a lot of contribution in the WordPress space, we might ask for more information. If they're not able to give much more information, it might be a yellow flag, as in not that big a difference, but uh, maybe one or two out of 10 or 20 is mm. average, maybe five to 10%. Because a lot of people who do apply are already working in the WordPress space. They just want to be able to contribute more. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's not a big uh, number of people are declined. Yeah. And just to add to that, I've also been vetting applicants for almost a year. In the whole year, I'd say I've had two people who weren't GPL compliant, at least on my first check. Um, and so I wrote to them and said, hey, I don't think you're GPL compliant. And um, one of the person actually clarified that they are. It was some wording in their website that was a bit confusing. So after that clarification, they were okay. The second person, they confirmed they weren't, um, but they were willing to change the licensing on their plugins so that it became GPL compliant so that they could contribute. Um, so as O'Neill said, there's a, there's a lot of spam. So um, aside from the spam, out of the real applicants in a year, I've had two people who I've noticed who aren't GPL compliant, but through conversations, they've both been um, able to update their licensing and get approved. So it's, yeah, I, I agree. It's very rare that somebody is just declined and like not allowed. Um, Rico, does that, does that answer your question? Does that give you enough information? And we have just a few more minutes. Yep. Um, if there are any other final questions you wanted to ask, I'm going to share my screen one more time. Um, so, you know, I was going to share the link to today's slides. Um, so let me drop that in the Zoom chat and then you'll be able to click on the links. Um, the slides also have um, presenter notes. Um, so you'll be able to read a lot more of what we've been talking about. There are extra links in the presenter notes. Um, so let me drop that in the Zoom chat. Again, you're free to, um, in a sense, like download, create a copy of this resources to look at later. And then the final slide has um, additional resources that sort of back up a lot of what we've been talking about today. Um, I think personally, the GPL license was all confusing when I started contributing to WordPress as well. Um, especially when, like, when I, I realized that you can have paid for products that are still GPL compliant. Um, the concept of free software, paid software that is still free as in it has freedom. Um, that was a bit confusing to me. And even now, sometimes when I'm vetting someone, you, um, if I come across a confusing situation, I will ask other administrators in the training team um, to get a second opinion um, because it is, a, it, it is a bit confusing. Um, but hopefully today, after this presentation, you've been able to understand GPL a bit better and you've been able to understand how GPL is used in the training team, how we check for GPL adherence. And more than anything, I hope you have been, you are interested in joining the training team and help us create content for the Learn WordPress website. Um, so yeah, um, once again, I dropped the onboarding program link in the Zoom chat here. Um, do take a look at that. And um, yeah, we're a few minutes early, but if there aren't any other questions, I think we might finish there. Thank you so much for attending everyone. Thank you for co-hosting with me on Neil. And I look forward to seeing everyone in another online workshop in future. Thank you for your time.